questions from the community while we yeah, speak? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah, the eagles have got until... Just like this, huh? Two hours. Two hours. Okay. Two hours. Two hours. Did you test? It's. I think it's working, no? Yep. Yeah. Good. All right, welcome everyone uh, to the session on uh, DHS2 end user ELMI solutions supporting supply chain and health program management. So uh, great to have you here. We'll be recording as well and we have some participants online and we'll also have one presenter online. So first, uh, my name is Brenna Horst, then uh, LMIS technical lead at the HISP Center here at the University of Oslo and I'll be presenting with... I'm George McGuire, the ELMIS technical advisor working with Brenna. Yeah. So we'll be presenting then end user ELMI solutions supporting supply chain and health program management. So I'll give a very quick intro just to kind of set the stage for what we're trying to propose, the approach. Um, and then we'll spend more time though on actually demoing uh, the features and uh, actually seeing the tools in action and the system in action. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on slides, but I want to just give a, a background we're doing actually two live demos, so we're asking for disaster, but knock on wood, uh, it should go well. So quickly on the agenda, then I'll do this introduction before we jump into the uh, demos and the sandbox, and you'll have access to this. You can actually download the mobile app, connect to the demo server to the sandbox, and then actually try these tools out on your own. Um, and then we'll have George continuing and presenting um, on a transaction-based stock management tool and an ICRC, so the Red Cross Committee project where they've implemented this, including an integration with, a, with an ERP. Uh, we'll then present, uh, have uh, Philip uh, Larson presenting on a remote temperature monitoring tool and integration with Bluetooth centers and how a pilot went in Mozambique and our plans for that tool. Uh, per Kronslev presenting with, from iPlus Solutions, an integration uh, project that we have ongoing in Mali with their Medexis ELMIS solution. And then finally, uh, from the Ministry of Health in Malawi, um, a tracker-based tool for managing uh, uh, cold chain equipment um, due to requirements specifically related to the COVID-19 pandemic. So those will be the different presentations. And then hopefully we'll have time for the Q&A at the end. And if not, you can, of course, speak to us in the hallway. So first, DHS2 and LMIS, the big why. Um, and for this, there's multiple reasons, but one is the synergy of um, DHS2, where it's already implemented, where you already have stock data captured within the system, and all of these implementations where you can see this from our website where it's currently implemented, and being able to connect this to your supply chain management, and also being able to analyze stock and health data to improve health program management. Already having this network, uh, both with the implementation, the support, the competence within the user base, uh, it's a huge benefit as opposed to implementing an end-to-end -end supply chain solution at a national level. The questions of cost, so cost efficiency, uh, licensing, being a tool that's already used by ministries, it can be then um, used for capturing uh, digital stock data, connecting with an ERP, connecting to your supply chain management. The number of uh, licenses that you would need uh, for implementing a full-scale um, uh, solution at the facility level may be prohibitive, and this is a way of reaching that last mile of the supply chain. The question of competence, where you may not have a dedicated stock or pharmacy person managing stocks at a facility, you have uh, caregivers who are also managing stocks and trying to report this data. And this is something that they can do with an application that they're familiar with, they're using to collect health data. And then you add a stock data set with which they report or some other stock tools. Um, and this makes it for a smoother transition and stock data capture for that user. So the what, so this is targeted uh, tools for this facility level user. So if we just have a representation here of a national um, supply chain from left to right, from a central to facility, we're really focusing at this end user level. We're looking at stock management tools, both report-based and transaction-based. And we'll show that to you later. Of course, this will be shared with you so you have these slides available. So stock management, I think is one key. Secondly, cold chain management. So that's both remote temperature monitoring, but also cold chain equipment monitoring and life cycle management. Uh, track and trace uh, capability and quality control for products being issued at facilities. The performance management dashboards, which of course are integrated with DHIS2 and available on Android, as you've seen in other presentations. 
And then also having a product catalog with different items, which the persons uh, um, at the facilities have access to with information. And we'll, we'll demo all of these. So the how, um, if we just quickly represent here the health information system on the right, the pillar uh, with DHS2 being used at multiple levels to capture and analyze health data. The way we foresee that in the logistics information pillar on the left here is you have DHS2 at this community health worker, health center and hospital level at the point of care being implemented again, oftentimes by a health worker who's also managing stocks. And that data is connected to a central system, connected to an ELMIS or an ERP, which provides your full scale supply chain management. So warehouse management at central and regional sites, but then also providing uh, demand planning, order management, and these uh, different functions that are very specialized for logistics, which we see better being provided by one of these specialized systems. Uh, when it comes to demand planning, they then have availability of accurate, timely, accurate consumption data from the DHS2 system, which oftentimes comes in through a paper-based system or another alternative solution. So now quickly, I'll go through seven different points, which I mentioned, mentioned before. So it's the report-based stock management. First and foremost, being able to report on monthly stock data using a data set configured in DHS2. Um, we recommend using it uh, on an Android device, providing online and offline capability. And this is one of the key aspects, digitizing the first data mile and making data available uh, for the supply chain management. Even if you don't have the central system in place, you do have accurate data from facilities at the, at the point of consumption. Um, and then also there's an option for doing this first at a district level, still reporting on paper, and then before moving to facility level reporting. Uh, so that can be done also at the district level in a first step. This data set, we have also a, a, a metadata package, which we make available on the website. And we also have this integrated in different packages like immunization and malaria stock data package, where it's integrated with the, uh, uh, the clinical health data. And then we're able to triangulate data between health and stocks. Uh, we're also working with a transaction-based stock management tool, which we hope to have integrated soon in the core that we can make it available later this year. Let's see if somebody from the Android team is here to <laughs> support, of course. Um, so this is looking at real-time stock management, having the ability to issue stocks and have immediate um, uh, view of your stock levels. And of course, having this real-time end-to-end visibility, which is sort of the gold standard and the objective of any um, uh, advanced uh, supply chain management system. So this is some, another tool which we'll demo and you'll see how that functions in practice. Remote temperature monitoring. Uh, for this, we're developing integration with a Bluetooth sensor where we then have these devices connected directly to the Android capture app um, to both allow for alerts and analysis of uh, cold chain uh, uh, of temperatures uh, in cold chain devices and monitoring vaccines. Biomedical equipment lifecycle management, so managing from point of installation, servicing all the way to end of life and having a full, uh, a fully contained uh, card uh, for that specific device. GS1 data matrix, so this is the ability to scan, parse, and then uh, uh, control the uh, medicines that are being issued at this point of consumption. And this is something that needs to be integrated with a database, but at least the feature to be able to scan uh, is there, and we see it being used as a quality control tool at facilities. Of course, the integrated dashboards here with a simple example showing uh, doses administered of a, a BCG vaccine or, uh, sorry, yeah, for different vaccines and the stocks that have been issued. And then a simple product catalog for the end user of what they have available at their sites. So um, as I mentioned before, we're not looking to provide an end-to-end -end tool, an end-to-end -end solution, but we're looking to focus on this facility level. So the ideal um, implementation would have a central system managing your supply from a central medical store down the supply chain, and then having DHIS2 um, capturing consumption level data, uh, values being shared between the two systems, uh, both uh, the amount shipped from a central store down to a facility, and then the consumption and quantities being issued um, down to that last data mile, uh, the last service mile, which is the first data mile. And then to highlight that a lot of this work in capturing this approach, developing these best practices and promoting this has been helped through this key partnership with the Stella Center of Excellence, 
uh, which we have some people present here today, which is a cooperation between uh, the University of Oslo, Oslo University of Basel, Swiss TPH, and uh, the Nov Novartis. So um, we have some representatives here and uh, we've worked together on this and they've really facilitated a lot of that work. So Fabian, Doug, Carlos, so thanks for the support. And with that, we'll go quickly to the sandbox because all of the different things which I've shown, we want to make available to you. We want you to test it, ask questions, implement it. So we'll go quickly to George who will actually show it and we'll um, do our best to make sure that all of the demos work as they should. Yeah, and we have the Android team lead in the room, so no pressure, right? <laughs> also the analytics team lead, so let's see if I pass the test. So until now we have been like, um, you know, holding uh, meetings, giving presentations, always showing PowerPoint slides, but actually the, um, the proof is in the pudding. So we basically have created a sandbox. We are now, all of you can connect uh, directly to uh, DHIS2 instance and uh, check out all the applications that we'll go through very briefly. I will not explain in detail, but just for you to know what's available in the package. So this is the, the URL to connect to. You have the username and the password on the website. I think there's a link already on the DHIS2 LMIS um, sub website. And for connecting to the Android, you also have the, the it's a QR code. So you don't have to type the, the URL. So the sandbox rules is bring your own toys. So it's Android only. Uh, the, charge your battery and bring your snacks. So we don't provide the, the toys for the sandbox. It's open around the clock. There is, a, there is a detailed documentation. So there's no secret. So the configuration of each of the, of the tools that I'm presenting is available. I think already available as a PDF or it will be available this week. The screenshots and the screen sharing is, is enabled. So you can share it on a desktop computer. It's one of the Android settings. So you can enter data um, and edit as you please, but every day the sandbox is cleaned. I think this is like the standard for, for the sandbox, uh, for the sandboxes. So if anything breaks, doesn't matter, it will be reset in the night and next day everything will be working again. And then we briefly show that the analytics are accessible also on mobile devices with a progressive web app. So you have to open it in a, in a Chrome browser. No hacking, please be nice. We already have bad points with our system administrators and we have to ask them to fix things. So briefly you have here on the left side, the sandbox uh, prototypes. Everything is designed for Android because basically our concept is like to have a Swiss knife in a pharmacy, in a clinic or a community health worker. So it will only work on a mobile device, like entering data on a desktop computer at the district level that works well for HMIS, but not really for stock management. So we have tried to use as much native functionality as possible, not to stress the developers too much. Of, uh, everything can be used offline. Of course, it's part of the DHIS2 concept. We try to make it as simple and uh, user-friendly for end users. We're not trying to do something complicated, just pro providing uh, basic functionality, but for the end user. But um, it's not simplistic at the same time. So it's well thought, through we have been thinking a lot of it fiddling a lot with the details and uh, Kirsten mentioned the first day stealing was the word of the day so you're welcome to copy to clone it to to steal it so that's why the configuration is there and hope to inspire you to adapt it to your own context and uh, needs and we are trying to also encourage best logistic practices like minimizing the data that you need to collect you don't need to usually collect a large amount of data. You just need to correct the, collect the right data. We are planning some more prototypes and any feedback is welcomed under the community. So I'll start with the, with the demo of the prototypes that you have seen in the screenshot. I'll just go top down. It's maybe not very logical, logical order. So the first one, is a biomedical equipment lifecycle management. So we have seen this is a need. Many people, they have different tools for alarms, for servicing, uh, for maintenance, the functional status. And we had the idea, we'll all put all of it in a, in a single tool. So the idea is that you can 
basically have different stages for the entire life cycle of your equipment. So it's, this is the first icon. It's a simple tracker program, everything is native. So first of all, you get a nice catalog. So you can click on the picture and you can see what device you're talking about. That's maybe easy with the refrigerators, but there's many different types. And in the hospital, you could have a lot of different pieces of equipment. If you click on the drop down here, you'll have a little uh, uh, kind of catalog with specifications that you can customize like the PQS code, the model, the brand, the expiry date, uh, uh, the warranty expiring, and you can customize it uh, to your needs. So that's kind of the, the product catalog, but that's just part of the actual application. And then you open the, the tracker program and you have these stages. So you can install the equipment. The biomedical engineer can then write the short report that it was installed, tested, commissioned, staff was trained and so on. I will not show all the details. So you, there's a WHO requirement that when you have an alarm on a refrigerator, normally you should be recording the, the reason for the alarm, uh, what caused it, how it weather and how it was resolved. Then the equipment status. So this is frequently asked for just, is, it, is the equipment working or not? Does it feature an alarm? and uh, basically have that on the dashboard. Then the biomedical engineers can report any servicing or repair. So if they clean the equipment, if they repair it, if they replace any parts, and eventually if you, when the equipment comes to the end of its lifetime, you dispose of it, you can also record that. So if you wanted to report, let's say an alarm, it's a simple tracker program with a stage, you just add a new event. And I will not take the time to, to show the details, but I guess you all know the tracker, you can enter text. And if you want to make it easy for your staff, you can also have drop down menus like saying, okay, the alarm was resolved and I didn't uh, report to my supervisor and just store it. So that's for the cold chain equipment or any kind of equipment, the first application. I, what I forgot to show is that you have a list of equipment and you might have uh, five refrigerators or 10 refrigerators in your store. So when you want to search for it, when you want to record the alarm status or the functional status, you can make a search for it. And so that you don't have to look for the equipment in a long list, you can just scan the barcode. Yeah, so that's the demo effect. Oh, it's actually working. And then that's the trap, click the search button and that equipment will actually come up, right? So that's the refrigerator that, so that avoids mistakes. You can also, people were asking about QR codes. You can also use QR codes or um, also NFCs are in, on the list. Okay, I moved on to the next the GS1 data matrix code. So thanks to the tracker tool, that's a great improvement. It looks like, doesn't look like anything very particular, but it's actually big if you are in need of it, if you're a pharmacist or working in this, on these issues. So I'm just going to demo it. So I'm just going to scan a GS1 data matrix code. It's not, it's not a QR code. It's a particular code that encodes the serial number, the batch number of a medicine. So you have the barcode icon here. I'm going to scan the GS1 data matrix code. So it has to be in focus. It needs a lot of light. Yeah, actually worked. So you can see, doesn't look like much. You have a long alphanumeric text string and you can see that you have the product ID, you have the batch number, the serial number and the expiry date. That is all in the text string, but it's encoded in a very specific way. It's not easy to read and you can't read it with a normal barcode reader. So you can do a lot of things with this one. I wrote it down because I actually can't, uh, couldn't memorize it. So you could use it to scan the GS1 data matrix code, let's say of a vaccine to record the batch number in the uh, e-registry um, when you vaccinate the child so that you have a reference if there's an adverse uh, effect. You could also just use it for the sake of recording the batch number so you know which child received which batch. Um, if there's a batch recall, you can say exactly which batches are in what facility. You could use it, we envisage that you can use this. Now you have the batch number in, in, a, in a code, 
that you can use it for batch level management. Um, you also have the expiry date. So the next thing we're going to do is that when you scan it and the product is expired, it will give you a warning on the screen. This product is expired, don't use it. Then if you have not heard about it complying with national track and trace uh, regulations. So this is already in force in the US, European Union, Japan since uh, February, 2019. And it's coming worldwide. So many countries are implementing it. So the use of these PS1 data matrix codes will be compulsory maybe in your country one day. And any application that you use for stock management, for management of medical medicines, uh, it will be mandatory to have this kind of functionality. Then there's a big project from UNICEF, so the drug quality verification for detecting counterfeit and sub, uh, falsified uh, medicines. So the idea is that you can scan the GS1 data matrix code. So every package that is manufactured by the manufacturer has its own number. So rather than having just a batch number for 10,000 packages, each and every box has its own number. And you scan it and you can then check in the database whether that product is uh, identified as counterfeit or not. And if it's counterfeit, uh, then you can alert the health worker not to use it. Uh, the track and trace also requires decommissioning. So in order to have this database, maintain this database of which uh, unit pack numbers are, are valid and which ones are not, you have to report whenever you uh, remove our unit pack from, from the supply chain. So when you distribute it, you have to report it to the database so that if anybody else would try to use the same unit pack uh, serialized number, you would get an alert. So we hope that we can build a tool for that. Then you can also track uh, serialized uh, packs, unit packs end to end. So the supply, the manufacturer is keeping a database and know exactly when they manufactured each unit pack. Ideally, you're tracing it through the supply chain up to the health worker or the immunization worker um, administering the, the vaccine. You could also combine that with geolocation. So there's one use case where you want to know if you donate medicines or the medicines are intended for use in a certain country and the, they turn up in another country, you could detect that. And the ultimate dream, maybe we talk about that in five years time, is that if you, can if you can track the exact path of this medicine through the supply chain end to end, and if you have a record that Philip will show of all your temperature uh, records of the refrigerators, and you know exactly in which refrigerator every uh, unit pack went, then you can have at the end the complete temperature record of your vaccine from the, vaccinate from the production line until it was injected into the arm of the child. So that would be a dream come through. So. so and probably there will be other applications um, for the GS1 data matrix code. So it's really like an enabling technology like barcodes that will have other, um, I'm sure that will have other uses. The healthcare product catalog, I can show it briefly. It's basically what you have already shown for the biomedical equipment, basically the same thing. It's a kind of tracker program without any stages. So again, you can customize your catalog and you can have a picture. If you're not sure what atropine is, you can have here, for example, the WHO essential medicines list um, classification and um, a short description. We also try to make a linked uh, URL to a document like the MSF essential drugs uh, guidelines, or if you want the treatment guidelines, you could link to that if you are connected to the internet. The health temperature, the temperature monitoring. So this is the, what we call the basic mode is instead of recording the temperature on a sheet of paper in the facility twice a day. So in the morning and in the afternoon, like minimum, maximum and current, you can do that now directly into DHIS2, which means that you have the record on, on the server and a cold chain technician at the district level or in the capital could basically review all the refrigerators and um, prioritize the maintenance, uh, the maintenance and repair. And then finally, the monthly stock uh, recording. So this is the, what we call the, the basic mode where you, um, enter, you count your stock every month 
you basically enter your stock on hand and you calculate from a stock card the stock that you have distributed and you enter it for all your items in the stock at the end of the month. Uh, very simple, but still uh, the idea is that you can collect it at the facility level and then have all the data on the server. Looks very simple, but to my knowledge, I, I don't know of any project, probably there are some, where people are actually collecting uh, stock data at the facility and then integrating it with an upstream system. So the last one, I will not go into details, just to mention that you can also do calculations. So our philosophy is that basically calculate, uh, only collect the essential data that you really need, which is the stock on hand and the stock distributed. But if there's a need also to like calculate the op opening balance and the closing balance, then that is also possible. It's just not appearing so currently. Okay, so that's all what I wanted to present on the sandbox. So as George said, this is available and you can access it through our site and you can um, uh, play with all these tools and uh, download the uh, Android capture and do everything that George just showed and also contact and give us uh, some uh, questions if you have. So just a, a big hand for George. And then, uh, <laughs> Not too fast. Yeah, you clap too early. So. <laughs> well, they can clap again. You didn't clap loud enough, so I'm saying. Oh. Yeah, chocolate. Okay. Right, exactly. Yeah. So I'm presenting the pharmacy stock management um, project from the International Committee of the Red Cross. So I'll start with. Unfortunately, the ICRC was not able to join uh, today. Um, I hope they will come next, next year and present, but I have been working for them for 25 years. So I guess I'm qualified to speak on their behalf. Um, so DHIS2 has already been um, implemented by the ICRC for the health management information system. So they use it for HMS. They also use it for the electronic medical record system. And the, the ICT team of the ICRC has uh, um, generously agreed to contribute the code that was developed by BAO Systems that I will present briefly and make it available to the community. So it was posted on Monday. It's available uh, on GitHub for anybody who wants to use it. Uh, you can basically download it, study the code. Um, only caveat is that it's not supported. I mean, the ICRC has support for its own project, but if you were to use the code, it's not supported, but we hope to have it um, integrated in the core and available maybe by the end of the year or early next year. Um, so the, this app has been developed uh, by Biosystems, uh, but in, in close co collaboration uh, with the HISP uh, center at the UIO. And also thanks to the Android team to make sure that it meets all the quality requirements, design requirements, and to make sure that it can be integrated into DHS to hopefully without too much uh, re-engineering. Okay, so the International Committee of the Red Cross, and this is an integration where DHS2 is used at the facility level, as I just showed briefly but it is actually integrated with an ERP system. So Oracle GDE is like one of the big uh, commercial systems that are used like SAP. Um, it's like a multi-million uh, dollar project uh, that took several years um, uh, to implement. It's a very complicated system with like 5,000 tables and 55,000 data fields. So it's a huge system which is one of the reasons why you're not going to use that at the facility level. So very briefly, if you have not heard about the International Committee of the Red Cross, which mainly works in conflict areas. So it's an independent neutral organization that was founded uh, in 1863, not 1963. Sorry for that. Uh, provides humanitarian protection and assistance to victims of war of armed conflicts, has uh, 20,000 of staff in about 100 countries. Um, works in international humanitarian diplo diplomacy and humanitarian uh, law. It's mainly, it's well, well known for helping uh, prisoners of war for detainees, but also has big economic security projects, so distributing food and household items 
also famous for restoring family links, providing water sanitation services, education also. And the health department supports first aid uh, units, facilities, primary health care facilities, um, primarily surgery, so war surgery and hospital services and physical rehabilitation. So the problem, I will be very brief because I think we all know the problem is the manual stock reporting at healthcare facilities. So you have a, um, the monthly stock report, then you have to physically transport that record in a car, sometimes uh, in a remote area. You have to bring it to a Red Cross office and there usually it is entered into an Excel file or um, uh, maybe an access database. But in any case, the written record has to be retyped. And then somebody is sitting there making the calculations based on an Excel file and their own uh, algorithms. And the, the problems with that, it's slow because you have a delay from recording the data on the paper until you have somebody typing it uh, in an office and in usually sending it by email to the, to the logistics team. You have to retype, so it's prone to error. You have very limited analysis because People often say there's a lack of data. Actually, there's tons of data, but the problem it's all in stacks of paper. So it's not accessible in the format that is useful for anybody because you would have to like go through many records to find out the paracetamol, what was the consumption for the last two years. It's all there, but it just nobody has would have time to dig out all the data. So lack of historical records in a consolidated way, and you have no no real monitoring. So you just have snapshots of your, of your stock report from let's say end of May. But if you want to know what your stock report was in December, you have to go to another record and, and dig it out. So it's uh, all uh, very inefficient. So these are basically the business requirements that we had for, for the project that uh, lasted 18 months after feasibility study. So it should be very simple. The health workers are already busy. The, um, they are often have many duties. You might not have a dedicated pharmacist. So the last thing you want to do is to give them another tool like the fifth app. You have to train them on and ask them to spend a lot of time entering data. So it's going, supposed to, to simplify their life. Then the offline capability, that was the main requirement. So, I mean, if DHIS didn't have the offline capability, then it would be impossible. It would not have been selected because the network connectivity. Um, I mean, there's few healthcare facilities where you have permanent 24-7 uh, internet connectivity. So then the requirement was that we want to uh, collect the data on a mobile device, um, collect, record it and collect it, and not on paper. So the idea is that you collect it directly in the pharmacy on the shelf, you can't stock, you enter it into a mobile device. And then that is synchronized with the server, so no recording on paper and then um, writing it uh, onto an electronic record. Then we, the requirement was real-time synchronization of data. So of course, that means you need a network connection, but at least if you collect your data at the end of the month, you finish your stock count, you synchronize your data. Then after the synchronization, that data is immediately available on the server. It means it's available at the facility, but also for the logistics, for the, medic, uh, for the medical planner. It's available in the capital, in your logistics center, in Geneva, even at the supply, you could share the data wherever you want. Then um, the requirement was to integrate and synchronize this system with Oracle so that you have a seamless um, order flow. Um, and the, a simple way of ordering, uh, calculating the replenishment orders through the interest level. We're not going to details for that. And this is quite remarkable. The storekeepers, they record only the stock on hand and the demand consumption, nothing else. So we try to keep it as simple as possible. And then for the advanced mode, the real-time mode that they will show the requirement was to have barcode scanning and speech-to-text conversion for entering values. And um, for the real-time mode, you basically, you record only the stock issues. So there's a single data, a data point that you collect and not a, a long list of, of data. And multilingual, so it's available in English, French, Spanish, Russian, and Arabic. So why DHIS2? As I mentioned, the ICRC has already implemented an ERP system up to the country level. So Juba, Kabul, 
uh, warehouse in Mogadishu, they are already running the ERP, so uh, no need to have DHIS2 at a higher level. Um, DHIS2 is already used as an HMS system, electronic medical record. So that means there's already in-house expertise, ICT, know the, the system and can maintain it. There's already an existing DHIS2 server, several instances, it's user-friendly. Um, as I mentioned, it's available as a mobile app. So Oracle is a great system, but there's no mobile app for that. It's uh, offline functionality I already mentioned. Um, for staff are familiar with DHIS2. And uh, again, basically you need to train the staff only on one tool, which is DHIS2 for HMIS, for logistics, EMR, any other tool. We're also looking in implementing the biomedical engineering, the temperature monitoring, so it will be a kind of one-stop shop. And it's multilingual and it's free and open source, which reduces the development time. So this is basically the very simple um, like architecture. So you have DHIS2 on the collecting on the mobile device, synchronizing with the server. It is in integrated with Iris. So Iris is kind of a uh, user portal, web portal for uh, Oracle TDE where uh, users can uh, prepare their orders. And it's also integrated with Tableau for the business analytics, because DHIS2 has native analytics functionality, but Tableau is an institutional BI tool, so you can have data from HR, finance, logistics, operations, all in one system. So there was a feasibility study carried out, then there was an 80 month pre-pilot uh, with the Somalia Recrescent Society in Somalia of all countries, believe it, in Somalia worked excellently. So they have been collecting data on DHIS2 since January last year without any interruption, without any major problems. And that kind of demonstrated the feasibility to use this. There's often a lot of skepticism using mobile devices. What if they break? What if you have no network connectivity? So Somalia has proved that this is very feasible. Um, that was used uh, with just with a default data entry form. It was not integrated. That was just to demonstrate the feasibility of using DHIS2. So the rollout is actually technical life was uh, last week and actually started yesterday. So it's planned in 50 facilities in seven countries to start with and hopefully will expand. So we this envisage to use it in 300 facilities uh, around the world. So only, of course, those facilities that are supported uh, with medical supplies by the Red Cross. Already mentioned the co-chairing. So just um, to demonstrate the simplicity, so the impressed level that is used for uh, calculating the monthly replenishment orders that is managed by the health program managers. So the, the storekeepers don't have access, it's grayed out for them, but they can still see the impress level just for the information. And the only data that is collected is the stock that is distributed from the first to the last day of the month and the stock on hand, nothing else. So we collect exactly the same data as is collected today on paper and keep it as simple as possible. So this is basically, uh, so I should have said, so this is what it looks like on the web portal for managing the impress level. And this is basically what the storekeeper sees on the mobile device. They have a single screen, a list of items. They can consult the impress level and they enter the stock on hand and the stock distributed. That's all they do. It's once a month. Couldn't be simpler than that. You have a login screen and then they go to this screen. It will default to their facility according to the user settings in THIS tool. So there's little room for error. So I will not explain that in detail, but uh, this is the Iris interface for Oracle GDE. You can see on the left side, this is what the ISRS uses worldwide as their uh, customer portal. It's a bit designed like Amazon. So you have uh, transportation, your order status, you have the catalog, you can check uh, prices. And of course you can make your orders. And the point is that this state is now synchronized. So this catalog, the list of these items is coming from DHIS2. So you can add and remove items in the DHIS2 web port and it will be added. And the prices, the unit packets coming from Oracle, the impress system is coming from DHIS2 and the stock on hand as well. And the stock on order, so the quantities that have been ordered but not delivered yet, 
Those are coming directly in real time from the Oracle system. And then this user interface will automatically calculate the monthly order, you can see here. And then you have the round, rounded order quantities. So the calculated quantities are like result of a mathematical calculation, but they will be rounded up to the next unit pack because you can't order 991 tablets, you can order only 1000. Um, and then the user, basically everything is like uh, spoon fed. As soon as the storekeeper in, uh, in Afghanistan or in, uh, in Congo synchronizes their data, it will appear on this screen. They can review the data if they like it, if they want, they can still increase or decrease the order quantities. And then it's not on the screen, you press a button, create order and validate your order as any other order. So it's a seamless system. There's no copy pasting, no Excel involved. That's my life mission, Excel free world. <laughs> so, um, and then we have the advanced real-time mode, I think, yeah. So that I will demonstrate briefly. So this was, this is the application, custom built application that was developed by Bao Systems, but it is really just a user interface. It is built on a, a conventional native tracker program with uh, five stages and two program rules. So really simple, could be set up in half an hour. And just to mention that in order to use the real time mode, you will have to have barcodes uh, on your item. So these are not product barcodes. These are generic barcodes. Let's say the barcode that you see in the middle, that's for Povidone, 10% uh, 200 milliliters. So any product from any manufacturer that is 10% and 200 milliliters can basically be managed with this barcode because managing, uh, managing your stocks with the product barcode, that's another story. Then you have many different barcodes for the same item and different packaging and so on. So that's, uh, that's a very simple system. So these barcodes are printed from Excel. You do it once, you attach it to the item and you're basically ready to go. So it takes an effort to set up your pharmacy um, to start with, but the picture that you see is actually from the pilot that uh, was facilitated by Breno from the uh, Norwegian Red Cross at that time, sorry, at that time, and the ICRC in, in Yemen, in Aden, believe it. And uh, we didn't use DHS2 at that time, but it was used, we used another tool for six months. It worked really well. And after using um, bean cards and stock cards for 25 years, once you have a barcode scanner, I tell you, you never want to see a batch card in your life again. Um, and I, I yeah, I, finished my work with the Red Cross. So now it's, it's tablets only. So quick, yeah, go ahead. I mean, at that it was managed without paper for six months. Yes. Yes. We trained somebody for that. Yeah. I forgot to show the analytics on the dashboard, but uh, you have basically the line listing uh, in the progressive web app. So if you have not tested the chocolate box yesterday yet, you can do that anytime after or in the break. So you can see, yeah. So the objective of the mobile app was to keep it as simple as possible. So you can either distribute stock, you can discard it if it is expired or if it is damaged, and you can make a stock correction if you find that the stock balance is not correct. So. Again, we tried to keep it as simple as possible. Initially, it was only one screen. We ended up with three, but still very simple. So we select the distribution. It will default to the organization unit that is set for the storekeeper. It will default to, the, to today's date. You can uh, predate it like five days. And all you need to do is to select the word or services, service you want to distribute your goods to. So I'll give it to the, let's say the high dependency unit. So for those who have not worked in, in, uh, in a pharmacy, uh, basically you have the, the in charge of the different departments, the operating theater, the emergency room, the pediatric ward, they will come every day or once a week or every two weeks, depending on the schedule with a list of items that they want the pharmacy to provide to that ward or service. And then what the storekeeper is basically doing all day in and out 
is going and picking those items from the shelf, preparing them and delivering it to the operating theater, for example. And today, if you do that, you have to basically, every time you take an item off the shelf, you have to take up what is called the bin card, the batch card, you have to write the date, you have to write the emergency word, you have to write the quantity and sign it and put the paper back on the shelf. Somebody's smiling, you know what I'm talking about. And then you take the next item and you fill in another bean card and you do that all day. It's really boring work. And it's much more fun with a barcode scan, of course. So this is replacing, it's not replacing your bean card, but it's replacing your stock card at least. So you select high dependency word, then you go to proceed. And then this is basically the stock we have. So we have four different types of chocolate, very special pharmacy. You want to work in this one. <laughs> so you can see that you can see at the top of the of the mobile app, you can see it, it's in green. It means you're distributing so that you're sure that you're in the right place. You're not discarding or correcting. You can have, you can see the organization unit, um, the date, and you can see the facility where you're distributing to just to make sure that uh, you don't mix up, you know, where, where this is going to. Now for selecting the items here, it's only four items, so it's easy. We have also the cookies, but we are out of stock. So is that if you have a long list, you have to scroll up and down. So a clinic might have 50, 80 items. A hospital would have 300, maybe 500, up to 1,000 items. So it's very boring to scroll up and down. Also easy to make a mistake because artisanate, for example, or automate, it comes in different strengths and you can easily mistype. So you can either, you could scroll if you uh, wanted, you could also make a search, but that's also boring. So the, the key uh, innovation, I mean, others have used it, but um, it's now available here is that you can scan the barcode. So I'm going to, to scan the, the yellow chocolate, right? So you can see it says chocolate yellow, and it doesn't look like much, but it tells you actually how much you have in stock. So you can, it says 35, there's actually 35. And um, if I'm the storekeeper, I'm going to pick two. So I'll just enter two and confirm that. Then I'll take another item from the shelf. Let's say the green one. So I'll take three. And now you can do something that is called uh, residual balance counting. So I'll, if there's 33 in stock, I'll pick three. And we are not expecting the storekeeper to check each and every time to recount how much is left on the shelf because that would take a lot of time. But normally in the pharmacy, medicines come in packages like drains and uh, catheters, bandages. Also, um, medicines are often like coming on overwrapped 10 packages of, of 10 ampules come in 100. So when you have a, a round number like 30 and it's three times 10, it's easy to check. It says 30 and I can check it's three packs of 10. And if it was 31 or 29, you would see it even without having to count one by one. So this is something that has worked well in Aden. We had, for example, boxes of 2000 masks and it's very easy. You have three boxes, you have 6,000 masks. It says you have 4,100, you take out 100. You should be taking a big box and putting it out of the pharmacy and have two big closed boxes with 4,000. If that is not the case, then you know immediately that you made a mistake in the stock count and it's easier to check it right away than um, to find out at the end of the month, we will not find the mistake. So you go on review. So you can check again, you have two yellow, three green. So that's correct, right? I trust it without my glasses. And that's basically all you need to do. You can still, you have this screen so that you can make a correction. You can remove a line, you can add a line, you can change the numbers. And if you confirm the distribution, then you just click on confirm. And basically that's all there is. You will see that there's now a small entry on the top of the list high dependency unit with the date and the time. It's just a short record that you know that you have made a delivery to this place. It doesn't give you the details. The details, you will have it in the progressive web app in the beautiful new line listings that was just launched fairly recently. And the line listing is basically now replacing your stock card 
it's basically an electronic stock card where you have a record of all your transactions. And what happens in this case is then the supervisor of the server frequents the server and then eventually integrates the server? Uh, with the web portal? Yeah. So the, the integration that is done by, uh, by ISRC with Oracle, it works for the for the default data entry form as well as for this one. So whenever you update your stock on hand and you go and you synchronize, I mean, this is like native functionality, you synchronize with the server, then that current stock on hand is available to the program managers for calculating the order. So in principle, if you have a good internet connection with a permanent internet connection, or let's say a uh, connection several times a day, then you have really real-time data so you can envisage the medical planner in Nairobi having a dashboard, checking every morning shortages in healthcare facilities rather than waiting for somebody to call them and tell them that they're out of stock. I finished just on time, right? Are we taking questions or? All right, a big thanks for uh, yeah. George. Somebody has to take the chocolate because my stock is otherwise not correct. Yeah. I'm not taking it back. And you will not find somebody with more enthusiasm or knowledge for logistics management than George McGuire. So you can get his autograph outside the door after the session. <laughs> um, I wonder if we have time for just one question while we get uh, Philip set up with the microphone. Does anybody have a question for George on the uh, presentation here now? Can I have a chocolate? What, that's what I was expecting. The answer is yes. I can, sorry, uh, just temperature monitoring uh, the earlier slides, the temperature monitoring, uh, the, is there any automatic connectivity or they have to enter manually every time? Ah, so is there any option there or not? Just on cue, this is what he's presenting now. <laughs> your, pr your prayers have been heard. He has the solution, seriously. Yeah. This is just a basic mode to get you started to put it on a mobile device. But yeah, if you can. Uh, okay. Other questions or we, we let Philip go? Yeah, I guess we can jump right into the uh, presentation because yeah. that's exactly what we'll present next year now. And we didn't pay him to ask this question really. This was <laughs> completely spontaneous. Cold chain monitoring using DHS2 capture app and Blue Maestro Bluetooth temperature sensor. Welcoming Philip Larson. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Philip. I'm a master student from uh, IFI. And together with uh, these guys and the Android team, uh, we've uh, worked on a cold chain monitoring app. So, yeah, uh, vaccines are really costful and uh, really, really important. Uh, issue regarding immunization, uh, as we know, and uh, the solution uh, is to improve cold chain monitoring. So uh, we've done this by utilizing some Bluetooth sensors and uh, an Android application. So yeah, uh, do you want to talk about the? Uh, yeah, the previous slide was mine as well. But you're so enthusiastic, <laughs> I thought I'd let you go. All right, so, so the two use cases that were present, and I'll present just the use case quickly, and then uh, Philip will go into the technical solution and then a pilot which we ran in Mozambique. So I think the first, uh, he gave the problem statement, which is temperature monitoring, ensuring uh, proper management of uh, uh, vaccines. So then the first one is providing temperature alerts. Uh, so with both uh, within a temperature threshold and providing real time audio or visual alert, and then a next escalation alert if no action is taken. And the second is recording temperature for analysis so that you can actually have a record of how um, uh, products were kept over a period of time. So those are the two main uh, requirements. And then just a quick example of this is based on aggregate data. So the manual input as George mentioned that you can then have analytics to map where you have alerts where you have issues with cold chain equipment where you need to do some corrective action, improve the equipment, and then provide also some analysis and seeing uh, it's very small type, but more or less, this is showing that regions which are more remote, more rural, low resource, you have more alerts. So you need a bit more follow-up on the infrastructure. This is from uh, Mali and Togo where this was being used with aggregate data. So then the technical solution and what then Philip will present is the automation of that, that you're not inputting manual data using thermometers, but you're actually having this digital sensor connecting to the device and then having 
uh, real-time alerts, and then integrated data for also supervisors at a district level. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so now over to, over to the fun part, at least what, uh, what I like. Uh, so the solution, the first part is the Bluetooth sensors, and it's quite small. It's waterproof, have a small watch battery that you can change. Uh, you can also adjust the, it advertises temperatures all the time and you can adjust uh, how often it should advertise and that affects the battery lifetime. And when you buy it uh, for approximately $35, it's uh, no subscription or you can just use it. And yeah, it's fully waterproof and uh, work in a, in a quite far range. So the other part of the solution is the cold chain monitoring application, which I developed as a part of my master thesis. And uh, I forked or stole the Skeleton uh, app from the DJI's to Android team, uh, which uh, has an integration to track your capture. And uh, through Bluetooth communication, I connected to the sensor and uh, so you can communicate it and get the temperature it advertises, and uh, storing that in a local database. So you can see all the devices are repairing different Bluetooth sensors. Uh, you can read the different temperature, temperature uh, that it advertises, and you can collect it and do other stuff. And also set alerts and export the temperature manually in the CSV file. So you have like a backup. So yeah, basically what I uh, uh, talked about now, it the Bluetooth sensors advertise temperature. The Android collects it through Bluetooth and you can then upload it to DJI's two servers and uh, visualize it in uh, data visualizer. And also there's a link to a video. I don't have a cool live demo like uh, George, but uh, maybe in a couple of days. Uh, so the other part was, uh, I've actually been so fortunate to pilot the application in the real settings in Zambesa in Mozambique. So the objectives was that we wanted to implement it in four facilities uh, and provide tablets, sensors, mobile data, everything to the facility and then train health facility workers to uh, use it. So we ensure they report and to digitize uh, manual reading task. So uh, the South Digitus uh, HISP group was taking care of me for about a month. Uh, I worked with the implementers uh, uh, in Sambesa and Seferino and George and Breno came down. Uh, and this was the current practice. Uh, the health facility workers recorded two times a day uh, in the morning and in the evening. Uh, the, this chart represents a year. So uh, after a year, they uh, delivered it to the immunization program. And sometimes it got uh, uh, like typed in manually to, to DJI's too. Uh, and um, when they recorded the temperature, they also took the estimated uh, vaccines of the day out in the vaccine carrier and put it outside at the vaccination station without any thermostats or anything. So you lost like the monitoring part. And when we asked if they experienced or if they have like a, a standardized way to, to handle when vaccines are spilled, they said they never had any issues with the, with the vaccines. So over three weeks, we launched uh, the app and implemented it at uh, uh, health facilities and we only gathered uh, the current temperature but of course we wanted to gather more uh, and the uh, alerts that uh, the application uh, supports we didn't have time to actually test that much um, and uh, we had some issues with the android uh, devices so we had to scale down to two facilities uh, but it went surprisingly well to implement and teach the facility levels uh, or the health workers. Uh, and we also discovered we attended a polio campaign and they were really keen on using the sensors because they're so small, you can just uh, have it in a vaccine carrier and they have 
vaccination stations out in the rural areas, but it's uh, nice to bring with them. So yeah, after the pilot, uh, we had some learnings. Um, of course, that it's uh, ad addition to the workflow that they really appreciated not reporting manually. And uh, it's easier to standardize uh, practices uh, in cold chain monitoring. And uh, there were a big difference in the cold chain equipment, how it functioned, how, uh, yeah. And uh, it, by using the application, you also get alerts, which also is a big need. Uh, yeah, I'll just. The technical implementation, I also had some difficulties. Uh, like I said, tablets didn't work uh, as expected due to different versions, both in Bluetooth and Android. And we also had some issues with the internet connectivity, like uh, the last step when uploading to the DJI's to servers, it could take really long time. And power outages was also, also a common thing. Uh, yeah, like I said, it went uh, really well from the uh, uh, working with the facility workers. Uh, they were actually really keen on using it. Uh, nevertheless, they didn't have so much experience with using technology. And uh, they also preferred using their own device because uh, one facility workers had three the Android devices and we gave him one more and he was like, no. <laughs> So we had to, he wanted the belt instead to keep, keep all the devices. Um, we also learned that we needed timestamps to prove that uh, the temperature was only not captured in that day, but at that exact time. So health workers didn't capture three, four times at the same time. Uh, and we also need aggregates like mean kinetic temperature to uh, reduce the storage uploaded to, to DJI's two servers. And there's also a need to generalize the application further. So this is just a prototype. So hopefully somebody, yeah, you want to talk about the way forward? Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, right, so this was really great to show that we could have uh, in collaboration with a master student based here at the university, develop a solution that was easily and readily implementable. So this was a, a minimum viable product, which we, we uh, uh, implemented there. And we identified a lot of both value added for the workflow for the users, the ones capturing data, and then also for the supervisors. And I think that was in a previous slide on actually being able to monitor and have data a bit more timely for their uh, general supervision without having to visit a site or waiting for that yearly uh, report. Uh, I'll get to a question, just one second pair. Um, the then priority for this and of all the different tools we're showing, this is the one that needs the most development. So that will be one of the top priorities is to improve this, to make it more implementable, expanding the uh, uh, implementation already in Mozambique uh, with the team is already uh, working on and then getting to a level where we can even apply for a PQS certification. Just want to give a much more like a comment, I guess. But the, the thing about those cold chain setups is, I mean, I don't know if you go to a given country, you might have a whatever. Uh, five, 6,000 uh, refrigerators, uh, freezers and refrigerators we're talking about, right? So right now, these ones, it's, uh, there's a similar model on, on this. That means the, the companies that deliver them, they deliver, they, they have these RTMDs in them, uh, remote temperature monitoring devices. So there's uh, certain things around it. They're very pricey, they're very costly. If you get this thing out there massively, you can break those monopolies. And the cost to and, and the cost to actually have those cold chains function will go vastly down because you don't have to have that specific brand out there. You can just have a functioning fridge. Yeah. Okay. So that's uh, we did not pay him to say that either. <laughs> just <laughs> as with Anand, um, this is exactly one of the points that we want to highlight. It's a storage set for the other that we're looking for. Uh, simplistic but well thought through solutions that can be implemented at scale. We're not. Uh, seeing uh, solutions that can target thousands and even tens of thousands of equipment, uh, providing remote temperature monitoring with this level of functionality, that can be done at a cost-effective uh, uh, way. So that's one of the things that we're looking to target is the ability to find a good solution that works well technically, but can also be implemented at scale and provide uh, value for the users. So that's a good point.
I, Hanan, you had a question before, so. Yes, uh, for this actually, smart tag, so what you are is a blue, uh, specific blue tags. But already uh, we have uh, 1100 reason which have already smart tag. So how those tags could be indicated? Or we have to buy each tag for the another 1100 device to buy for the students? Yeah, so it depends on the technology. Yeah. This utilizes BLE, it's Bluetooth Low Energy. So it. Uh, all new players we buy for the COVID. It's all yeah, okay. So like the communication part is already set up and maybe eventually in the future it's part of the core and then it's so generalized that it doesn't matter which device you have as long as it's BLE, it can be used through that. So you have to talk to this guy. That's a very <laughs> <laughs> so with all of the two. Yeah, so uh, all of the tools we've shown are available now. A lot of them are native configuration for the transaction-based stock management tool that will be later this year to early next year. And this is the one that is least developed, as I said. So this is still the, the one that's most work in progress. It's difficult to, to promise you now, but I would expect early next year. But uh, for the meantime, we'll be just upscaling the uh, pilot in, in Zambezi as we make improvements to the app. Okay. Hmm. Sure. I think we have uh, time for you have one more question. I think just very simple ones. Yeah. Uh, is, is the open, is it open, open source code? And uh, if yes, can the links be shared? Yes, it's open source. It's on GitHub and uh, I'll provide it. Yeah. <laughs> Good. I wonder if we can maybe save some questions for the end because we'll move on to Pair and uh, iPod Solutions and the Medexis ELMIS. So a big hand first for Philip. Thank you so much. Okay, does it work now? Okay, thank you. Okay, so, um, yeah. So I, um, okay, I wanna start a little bit some years ago. Uh, so actually about three years ago, started talking to Scott. Uh, that was before these guys even came on board because we got this idea of uh, using DHIS2 in the context of this LMIS. And uh, it has turned into a concrete project now, actually, hopefully two, almost two, I'll get back to that. Um, anyway, uh, talking to Scott was the idea was as this, that you got this DHIS2 out everywhere, even at health facility level, at the same time, there's big issues around getting LMISs to work in the countries. I'll get back to why that's an issue. So we wanted to try to combine things. That's what I want to talk about now. Uh, this is a project, this is a very concrete project, uh, which is part of my work in Mali. Uh, and it's, uh, well, obviously funded by USAID. I think that's clear. Uh, so, uh, but, so, but let's, uh, uh, yeah, let's move on. So uh, it's about interoperability between our uh, LMIS and uh, DHIS2. So, okay, I do that, thank you. Yeah, I'll just do that. Yes, it's fine. So uh, the name of the project is Kenya Sensi Wale. It's a, it's a large health project. So it's not an LMIS project, it's a health project. It, it includes all sorts of things around these health facilities. We are a small component in it. Um, and it's, well, it's done by Palladium uh, and we are a subcontractor to Palladium. So, okay. It works, okay. So uh, very briefly on the project itself, it includes the three most populous regions in Mali, everything around health facilities in those regions, you know, how they manage their money, their doctors, all sorts of things. We are the supply chain part. And who are we? I think that, oh, it's coming. Uh, well, anyway, that number of various goals, I'm not gonna dig into this, uh, but we got, uh, people at all different levels there working with this this part uh, and yeah who are we so I work with iPlus solutions and we are uh, strictly doing supply chain work 
We've got one major task, which most some people know we do, is we are the procurement agent for the Global Fund, global fund uh, as it says, uh, for a, a number of commodities. We're pretty big in that one. But we also do technical assistance. We also work with systems in countries. Uh, in that respect, we're relatively small, but we have this and we have a number of different projects and we work a lot around systems, uh, technology, how to use that. Yes. Uh, we're having this uh, iPlus Academy, that's a web learning basis. And we got the system called Medexis, which I will talk about now. Yeah, so now we get to the really interesting part, the challenge. Uh, so, uh, I mean, right now we, you've got, uh, we put a, a role on Mars, right? We got, I mean, we've done a lot of things. You've got uh, health facilities out there. People use mobile phones, they're on Facebook, all these things. At the same time, in big, big parts of Africa, people still have big pieces of paper like this and they fill them in and fill them in and fill them in with, with various information around these products. They get these papers together. And sometimes they just stay there. Sometimes they move to a district. They might even also fill them in. At some stage, it's probably punched into a spreadsheet. At some stage, the data ends up somewhere. Uh, anybody who works with logistics knows that that is pretty useless. The moment the data is a month, two months old, it's just too old. It's not interesting to know what was in stock three months ago somewhere. That's not interesting. But that's still a reality. Why? Uh, well, that is, I would claim, it's got to do with cost and complexity and maybe also the, the whole approach has been there for a while. Because uh, you can put, you, the ELMS solution has been there for at least 15 years, functioning solutions, they've been there. But they've been made based on a technology approach, on a technical approach. Uh, view on things, right? That means you find you make a nice system, this and that, and say, okay, now we train people on this. And that's when you have hit a big problem, usually. Because if you're going to do this in a country, okay, how many health facilities you got? 4,000? 5,000? Oh, you've got maybe 4,000 health facilities. Ideally, you should train two people per health facility. That's 8,000 people. Now, a third of them will change jobs every year. That's normal. These are in these, they don't stay that long in these jobs. So every year, then you're going to train a couple of thousand also. If you've got a relative complex piece of software, you want to train for people in rural Africa on that, like that, it will cost a fortune. Uh, especially USA has spent those fortunes in a few countries and they have succeeded, you could say but it costs a lot of money. And it has actually tanked uh, to a wide extent in many other places because the donors have pulled back from it. They say, oh, oh yeah, we can, put, we can do the implementation, but then after that, we will not every year put in a couple of million dollars every year just to make the machine money. So that's the problem. Now, that's a challenge, right? So why are we there? So this is an attempt to deal with that. I just said that. Uh, now, so the idea is to combine DHIS2 interface with a real LMIS. That's the idea. And, and because as George referred to this cost actually. So it, it's to deal with this implementation cost, the maintenance cost, to make, to, to make it happen. That's the whole approach, right? Uh, to deal with that main issue. Okay, so now we're in Mali. I got this project. Uh, so, in Mali, the way it works in Mali is that um, you got, uh, there is actually a DHIS2 is in every health facility and they report into DHIS2 every month. And they also report some simple logistics data, stock on hand, uh, consumption, uh, expiries, these kind of things. Now, this data in Mali today is aggregated, it goes into DHIS2 it reaches a dashboard. It's called OSP Sante. And this dashboard is watched by Minister of Health, donors, kind of people. Uh, but there are some issues about it. Uh, one is that the, it goes in there, 
There are certain delays, and later on they look at this, but there's no connection to the supply chain. The way they manage the supply chain is on paper, on the bin cards, the, the piece of paper, you know? And then they transfer that into another piece of paper where they do the calculations, calculations, the final calculation, and that one's written into another piece of paper, and then that paper goes physically to the district, and then the district figures out how much to send. It's about one and a half months process. Uh, so no link between the digital flow and the supply chain flow. Um, and then there's a lot of issues around stockouts and issues in the sense that uh, the problem is there is actually products out there. There's products at central level, but we've got lots of problems with the supply chain at, between the level of district and health facility and between the, the CMS store or regional CMS store and district because of this paper show, right? That's the situation there. Now, okay. So the concept, what we thought of, uh, actually now it's quite a while ago, it's one and a half year ago, I think. Um, I'll get back to that. It didn't take that long to figure it out. It's taken a long, long time to make anything happen. But uh, what we thought of was to take that data and then take it from the DHIS2, enter it in, and immediately put it into an LMIS, work with it at district level, and then figure out how much product to send to the health facility. Right, that's the idea, that's the concept. Uh, and, and also after that, to go into incremental improvement, because it's pretty obvious, the moment you make it work, you could start work with the frequency, for instance, maybe go from monthly to weekly. You could do various things. You could also actually work with, you could give them an app. You could, you could give the workers an app and say, okay, like, uh, like this thing George showed, could do that. Uh, there are a number of possibilities the moment we get started, right? So um, now, okay, I'm not, I'll, I'll try to do this. It can, Okay, I'll, I'll go a little bit quicker. Right? I don't know if that makes sense, but so the idea, the SESCOM, that's a health facility in Mali. It's called, it's called SESCOMs in Mali, right? The DRC, that is the district level. So the idea is we get these, uh, the stock position, the consumption estimate, uh, we get that from the health facility directly into DHI2. It reaches Medex, this, that's, uh, this, is, this is an uh, LMIS, E-LMIS, which we got. It could also be another one, but this is our E-LMIS. It reaches that one, and there's an integration which can be created with the help from uh, the team here, George, Breno. Uh, so it reaches that one. And then because then in that E-LMIS, we can do the calculations, we can do the things you do in an E-LMIS, uh, which DHI2 is not so good for. Um, and we can, of course, create an order at the district. The district can sit and work with the ELMIS in a proper way, do all those things. They create an order. It can be shipped to the SESCOM. And uh, phase one, that, by the way, for the donated products. And then for the phase two is for the procured products. That's more complicated because you've got money involved. The donated products, we can do that as a push, an active push. Uh, the, the procured products, we can't do exactly the same, obviously, because they have to pay for it. Uh, so there, you, you can't just have the district deciding now I'll send you a hundred. I mean, because I mean, the guys who receive the, those actually have to pay for it. The, that's why we have to split it in two. Anyway, now, uh, I'll just go. oh yeah, the, and, oh, and the dashboard remains, right? We're not gonna touch that one because all the data goes still into the HIS2, but the dashboard picks it up, so we're not touching the dashboard. And that's, it's one of the learnings we're dealing by this, is there are certain things you should just, um, that, uh, in life there are things you should fight, with the battles you take and battles you should not take. One of the battles you don't take is, for instance, don't try to change people's dashboards. They like them. <laughs> uh, so don't, don't say, I'll give you another dashboard, you can do the same, it's all very interesting, let them have the dashboard. Uh, it's much better, and that's what we do here. So it stays, they like it, no problem. 
and we'll get the data. Uh, okay, so what are we gonna do short term? Uh, short term, so the data goes into the uh, DHIS2. As today, that means the health facility will have no change whatsoever. We don't have to train them, anything. we have to do anything. We just, but the difference, there's still a big difference because now we will take the data. I mean, the, the paper flow, the order flow to the district will stop. So we'll take the data and get into the system and we'll generate the, the, the order in there and then we ship the products. So for the health facility, there's no change. For the district, there's a substantial change and there's training and things involved. But after all, we're only talking, uh, we're dealing with in total uh, 28 districts in those three regions. So that's doable, right? 28 districts, we have to manage, work with 50, 60 people in total, that we can do. Um, so we'll take that, the district will work with this and then, uh, it goes into our, this Medexis, they work with at the district level, and then we generate the order. That's the short term. Um, yeah, so uh, another advantage you get is actually on the data side, because right now there are problems with the data they put in there, because the only reason why they put the data in there is because they're told to do so. They have to do so, right? But it's not used for anything, really. There's somebody who might make noise if you don't do it right, but it's not really used. But of course, we might get some challenges now. We realize that in the sense that what will happen now is to put the wrong data in, the, 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 the supply chain is not going to work. And so now they, we got to get the right data in there. So it will also most likely improve the data flow. I mean, the, the, the visibility in the OSP Sante in the dashboard. The whole data need to improve because if it's data in the digital side is wrong, well, we having the supply won't work. So everybody will have a whole new interest in making that digital data work. They have to have that. I, I, we also realize that will be a challenge which we'll face, but it can also be seen as a big advantage uh, that you actually have to make it work. Uh, we get simpler calculations, uh, we get the cold chain uh, systems on, more or less the same as George was talking about. The same, same, we, we're also going to hook these uh, freezers and fridges up to the system so we can monitor uh, the cold chain. Uh, yeah, and we'll do the informed push, that's another thing, for the donated parts only, but informed push, so we, we're not more depending upon the sit and calculate the right number to, to issue it'll be calculated based on the stock levels. So that is the short term, but short term, no change for health facilities whatsoever, means also real cheap implementation, only training those districts. But longer term, yeah. A longer term, there's obviously some possible perspectives. Uh, uh, and, and somebody from, uh, I see somebody from the project that told me, ah, be careful what you say, so I'm careful, but. Uh, well, we, we don't have money for doing a whole lot of things, but who knows, given we manage short term, that perspective longer term, and then money maybe can be found. We realize we first have to succeed for short term, right? And longer term, you could obviously, for instance, the health workers, the, the, the primary health workers, uh, you, you've got these, um, what they call community-based uh, health workers going out there. Each community-based health worker is they are today asked to fill in every month a, a table around their products. That table has 1,500 fields. We're talking, we're talking it, 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 it's, it's a person with a bicycle and some medicines and stuff. And she has this huge form she has to fill in, right? On paper, and this paper then goes on to the, to the health facility who will pass it on to the district who may or may not punch it into uh, something, right? Uh, so not into digitized too. Obviously, we would like to digitize this. I mean, we could, a little bit longer term, go on some mobile apps, simplify things and all these things. All this is a possibility when we get moving, given we get started with this short term stuff. So there are many nice perspectives if we get going. Um, yeah, where are we now? Uh, okay, yeah, where are we now? Exactly right now. So. Uh, actually, uh, yeah, we are, um, 
we got all this design done, all this and that. Uh, uh, there's uh, a, a work and the trainings and things are starting next week, actually. Right, about you, you'll be on next week anyway. So, I mean, we, we start in, in uh, next week with things. Hopefully, in two months, we should be out there in a number of other facilities. Hopefully. Hopefully, in six, seven months, we should be there for quite many districts. At least that's what we've been promised. So we are just on the brink of rolling this out. Technically, the solutions exist now. Right now, it's about putting it out there. Uh, we finally have all the signatures in place, all the meetings has been through, all the ones that need to say yes, all of that. Um, okay. okay, yeah, so yeah. With, yeah, as I said, we are doing the pilot, rolling out all this. We are actually starting, literally starting next week. Uh, process and learning, yeah, so. Um, getting the idea, well, it didn't take that long. This is just talking to people and it was fun, a few months and making some papers, yeah. Now, but the, the dialogue with different stakeholders and talking to people like that, more than, I mean, I don't know, one and a half year, more than a year, it takes a long time. There's a lot of people that has to get what you actually want to do here uh, and want it. They have to want it, right? Um, it's essential, obviously, to keep Minister of Health uh, part of it. Uh, I know it's, it's a no-brainer, I know that, but I'm just saying we also learned that. And also, set, I mean, Minister of Health is, is, is many things, right? There are many parts of a Ministry of Health. And you may think you're okay because you're talking to a certain part of the Minister of Health, but you forgot those guys over there. And that is not always good. Uh, so, so there's a whole lot of inter uh, politics and things to manage within that, and that is, really needs to be watched. Uh, there are multiple stakeholders involved. Also. Uh, it, it, you also have the Gavi, the USA, the Global Funds, all those people, uh, and they may not have any idea of what's happening, and it's a good idea to try to keep them informed also, because they actually may start new initiatives in various ways. Uh, yeah. Um, it, uh, the work with, with George and Breno has been very important for us because we've got this DHIS2 integration all this time. So it's, it, I mean, it's been, it's, well, I, we basically haven't managed without, I'd say that. I don't think so. So it's been instrumental. Um, it, it was important to put together some technical concepts to actually show people, because one thing is to put the PowerPoints up there and then and make this big piece of paper, say we want to do this and that, but people, they don't really, believe it until you actually show them and, and do things like George did before. Say, okay, I have this app and do the chocolate thing and that. Then say, okay, it works. So you've got to do something like this before you are in front of that group of people because the ministers of health and the donor guys and those, they have all seen people who say a lot of things before. But they like, you, you, it's good to have this something to show. Um, and then another thing, I guess, a learning uh, or evaluation after this. Sometimes uh, it's, it's fun to figure all this technical stuff out and do this and, and in your little bubble, you do things you get together. But in that work, you can tend to forget the stakeholders. And then you're moved on together with your the other friends in your little bubble and think, oh, now we have a great thing to do here. Oh, we would like to do a pilot. But uh, then you've forgotten the, the stakeholders a little bit. And then you come and say, oh, we would like to do this. They're like, oh, well, we didn't hear from you the last five months. So uh, now you've got something. And then, then they might not be so collaborative when you start wanting doing things with the health facilities without having talked to them before. So uh, you must, when you do this fun technical stuff, it's very important to forget, to, to remember those stakeholders and hold their hands. That's it. I think that's last one. Uh, these are, uh, this is uh, paper copies, you can just take them, that's why they're there. So. Uh, big thank you to Pierre, and it's uh, been great to uh, collaborate with them so far, and we hope to have some yeah. success in Bali in the coming weeks. Yeah, and then, by the way, we, we are actually, hopefully, seems to be not so far from getting them in the Fantastic. <laughs> Looking forward to it. All right, so um, just to mention also that we're working with multiple uh, ELMISs, we have the same approach, integration, so... Uh, 
Uh, we also uh, suggest that you follow guidance on selecting an ELMIS and that uh, we're happy to work with many of the different platforms that are there. So as the last presentation in this session, we'll go to uh, Ministry of Health in Malawi and Blessings Kamonga, who will present a solution developed during the uh, COVID pandemic for uh, equipment tracking. So I will stop sharing. And Blessings, are you there? Can you share your screen and we'll follow along here? Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Blessings, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Sorry, blessings, just talk one more time for me. Can you hear me? Hello? No, no, no. Just yes, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, so uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Blessings Ntezem Kamanga. I work for the uh, Minister of Health uh, in the oh, digital. Sorry, Blessings, we can't hear you. Hold on for a moment. Hello, can you hear me now? I can hear you. Ah, okay, great. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Blessings Ntezem Kamanga. I work for the uh, Minister of Health. Uh, in the yeah, I can see that you're coming through. Um, just struggling to figure out why you're not coming through here. Bear with us just a minute. Okay. This is the HDMI. Connected with you. So you should be sharing on here. So. Literally, we did this yesterday and it was fine. <laughs> um, there's no separate audio cable. No, 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 there's no separate audio cable. It should just come straight through the HDMI. It should come straight through the HDMI. And the configuration on the. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, what's this plugged into? It's okay. power. This is the HDMI from the laptop. Wow, I'm coming through. If anybody has any questions for George, Philip, Pear in the meantime, maybe uh, we can take that while uh, it was fixed. Question in the back? Yes, thank you very much uh, for the time. Um, I have two questions. Uh, question number one is that I understand the best to remote for our application. So I would like to just understand how you can why I'm making more customizing data to to be containing data for telling and 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 telling Hello, you want to? Uh, we can take the second question first, uh, Pear, uh, go ahead for the second, and then we'll take the first question. Uh, the thing is that the uh, ERP that we have to send a level for is a much larger system. It's not uh, it's really not suitable. But you could, but it would be very costly and complicated. But it, it's not good to use a real ERP to manage uh, district level transactions. It can be possible, but it's very possible to write the information So, so therefore, there's a need for a, a, a simple NMIS There's this type of the the You don't need one of those. It doesn't matter. 
but it's not safe to do it in the but it's not a good idea because it would be costly and costly. But we came in as a partner having already stopped data in DHS2, which is kind of approach, but I think yeah, it's, a, it's a valid point. And then on, uh, just to be clear that we have both the aggregate data, which we could report, or transaction-based data, which is based on the tracker data model. And that's where the PSM app or the app that Georgia uh, demo is, is built on top of. I don't know if you want to say anything more on that on having the... Well, I'm not sure I understood the question correctly, but basically what we're doing in, in, in Mali is we have a very simple data and form. Basically the one that like a demo, it has uh, I think five or six columns. So once a month, we are collecting data on stock on hand, consumption, stock receipt, in the default data entry form at the end of the month, synchronizing. And that is actually directly integrated with Medexis. And the beauty of that is that Medexis can connect to the DHS to endpoints. So it's relatively easy to do the integration. Just, just to well, show you, the ATSP in this case is simply used. So, like, we've got a list in our top page. Yeah. Yeah. When it is connecting the logistics, it's collecting um, stock data. So, the stock on hand, stock receipt, stock inside, stock receipt, 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 stock because Medexis is doing the, cal the calculation that I showed that it's done in Oracle, mm -hmm. it's done in Medexis also. It's like an automated system that you do the, you can do all your yeah. calculations. Hold on, do you Yeah. I mean, I It's like at least one year, but yeah, no. At least one year, we all find a way around. But basically, the time is going to spend for the library. They're really, really complicated. They're really, really expensive. It takes three experts to support the issues. And they are also expensive because you have to pay license fees for users. So I would also, I think, it's the most thought to implement it at a logistic level. No systems are being made for large systems. Another question? The, uh, the enhancements for transactional stock management is coming up. Do you anticipate I mean, there'll be like warehouse to warehouse stock transfer type functionality in that? We have a spec or future development. We're looking at distribution now. So it's like distribution, but not in okay. facilities. And then the idea would be to have an additional Shipping, uh, what we saw for this at the distribution, it's really only for the last mile. Document, document target software standard for immunization of life. Um, and there you have a whole set of requirements for an end to end solution, and we're targeting very specific features. So maybe what we can do is we have our user mapped up what we're targeting. Blessings, can you talk? Uh, yes, hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. Okay, I guess I can go ahead. Um, Uh, Breno, can you confirm if I can go ahead? Thank you. This 
see why we selected the blue mask for temperature sensing because you're sorry blessings can you talk again sorry it's the only yes okay. it's the only blue proof temperature sensor Because we hope to also have. I got confirmation that um, uh, I'm audible. Uh, sorry, blessings, you there? Okay, thanks. Hi, sorry. Yeah, uh, sorry, we just had an issue with you uh, connecting in the room, but we've got you now. So uh, I'll hand you back over to Bruno. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, our apologies, blessings, but welcome. And we're uh, ready and eager to hear your presentation. So please go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you, Bruno. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Blessings Ntezem Kamanga. I work for the Minister of Health in the Digital Health Division as a product manager. So I uh, will be presenting uh, on behalf of uh, the project team members listed here uh, on a, a use case of uh, DHS2 Tracker uh, on improving monitoring and management of cold chain equipment in Malawi. Okay. okay, so uh, that's the outline of um, my presentation. So uh, a bit of a background. So the expanded program on immunization in Malawi was uh, established in 1979 uh, with a sole mandate of uh, ensuring that uh, infants or children are being vaccinated uh, uh, routinely. So uh, as of from 2020, uh, 20, uh, annually about 800 uh, thousand children are vaccinated and then in order to ensure that uh, these vaccines are delivered uh, the component of uh, code, code, chain, code chain storage uh, uh, is critical so we have uh, about 900 code chain storage points which are located at different uh, points so we have some at uh, national level we have some at districts and then some are at uh, uh, facility level and then with coming in of uh, COVID-19, it added unprecedented pressure uh, on the immunization supply chain, uh, uh, considering that uh, there were some vaccines which uh, uh, had a, uh, a short time before uh, expiring. So uh, there was an analysis uh, which was done uh, to look at uh, the gap uh, which was there in terms of uh, cold chain uh, storage. And then from the analysis, uh, it showed that uh, there is need for uh, more cold chain equipment ensure, uh, to ensure that uh, the uh, routine vaccines as well as uh, COVID-19 vaccines are, are, are safely uh, administered. So the genesis of the idea, so for the last uh, 40 years, uh, we have seen uh, barcodes or QR codes uh, being used uh, in various sectors. So for instance, uh, uh, these are, are used in uh, packages of food and consumers. Uh, so for instance, if someone goes in the shops, you, you see uh, 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 quite a number of use of uh, barcodes as well as uh, uh, QR codes. So the Global Immunization Committee uh, has also been uh, keen in exploring uh, the potential use of uh, barcodes as well as uh, QR codes uh, in vaccine supply chains. So the intention is to ensure that uh, information is extracted uh, as, as quickly as, uh, as possible uh, from the printed version into uh, electronic format. Uh, so currently in Malawi, uh, they use the Microsoft Excel files in managing uh, as well as uh, monitoring the uh, code chain equipment. So this comes uh, with a lot of uh, challenges. So for instance, it means uh, each code chain storage uh, point has to uh, maintain its own version of the uh, Excel file. And then it's very difficult uh, to have an analysis uh, of like an overall picture of the whole country. And then it also takes time, uh, for instance, if there is some breakage in the cold chain equipment uh, for them to be replaced because of lack of time of communication uh, on the same. So uh, that's why it is essential to have uh, a digitalized cold chain equipment uh, uh, that would help in making uh, timely uh, decisions. So the digital cold chain equipment inventory uh, would have various advantages. So for instance, uh, because the, it will be time reported, it will be easy to phase out uh, old cold chain equipment, uh, as well as the, uh, uh, assessing uh, the cold uh, chain storage. 
uh, apart from uh, real-time tracking uh, of uh, uh, breakdowns as well as uh, other transactions uh, for the code chain equipments. Hence, the project team uh, intended to develop uh, what is called an EVAX code uh, chain guard. So this is uh, a tracker program, uh, which is implemented uh, on uh, one surveillance platform, or HSP, uh, which is based on uh, DHIS2. So the primary objective is to ensure that uh, the code chain equipment inventory management system uh, is digitalized uh, with the use of uh, QR codes as well as uh, DHS2 tracker. But apart from that, uh, this would also aid in reducing the errors that are there uh, in the, uh, doing data entry for code chain equipment inventory, as well as it will reduce uh, the workload uh, uh, that uh, health workers uh, in car by, uh, with, by by introducing uh, this uh, new technology. Uh, and then the idea is that uh, uh, we'll sample uh, some uh, sites uh, to ensure that uh, this is uh, piloted and uh, enough feedback uh, is gotten. So you know the idea of uh, change management uh, and the like, you need to ensure that uh, the users are uh, involved as much as possible. So the idea is to uh, pilot uh, in about uh, uh, seven sites or so. So we have one national vaccine store, uh, one regional vaccine store, or one at district, as well as uh, about four uh, health, health facilities. And then there are key activities that have been aligned. So uh, one is finalizing the stakeholders for, for the project, and then uh, we'll have to prepare the concept note as well as uh, the budget, and then uh, all these other uh, activities uh, we'll follow up to uh, the piloting, uh, the training, and then uh, finally, uh, based on the pilot, we'll have to uh, expand or roll out uh, the project to uh, some other, uh, some other uh, facilities. So this is the uh, information flow. So we uh, have uh, uh, the various functions of the EVAX code chain guide. So uh, we have the code chain equipments themselves as they attract the entity uh, types. And then uh, each of uh, those will be enrolled uh, into the e code chain, guard the uh, tracker program. And then once that these are enrolled, uh, there will be two stages. There are two stages. So we have one, uh, which we are calling manage CCE code chain equipment uh, transactions. So here, basically you are looking at uh, cases whereby some facility may be in need of uh, the code chain equipment. So you are transferring code chain equipment from one facility uh, to the other. So uh, we have a receipt, dispatch, as well as uh, ring off the code chain equipment. And then the other stage, we are just uh, looking at monitoring the operational status of the code chain equipment. So whether the uh, equipment is a forte, it's working, or uh, uh, it needs uh, some, uh, some maintenance and the like. And then uh, there is also uh, status alert notification. So we are looking at notifying the code chain technicians, the API officers, as well as uh, other key stakeholders. So for instance, uh, if some code chain equipment uh, is not working, uh, once uh, the data entry click uh, updates that in the system, uh, it should be able to send an alert uh, to these officers to ensure that a, a timely uh, intervention uh, is done. So there is also analytics part uh, where we're looking at analyzing data both for the enrollments as well as uh, for various events in these stages, and then we'll have uh, dashboards uh, that uh, stakeholders as well as decision makers can uh, access and make uh, timely decisions. So in terms of the uh, attributes uh, that uh, uh, be captured, so we have uh, the manufacturer uh, brand name, the model numbers, the serial number equipment type uh, and so on and so forth. So upon receipt of uh, each code chain equipment, uh, a QR code uh, is generated and then uh, that is used to uniquely identify each of the code chain equipment. And then the other transactions I mentioned, as I mentioned, the uh, transaction management as well as uh, the monitoring uh, uh, thereafter, uh, it happens. So uh, this is just a screenshot of uh, uh, the enrollment page. So uh, if you are using a mobile gadget, uh, you can scan the uh, QR code. You can also use uh, the web uh, by entering uh, uh, these various fields. So others uh, be entered uh, manually and then others uh, you're able to select from the uh, drop-down list. 
So apart from that, uh, uh, there are other attributes that uh, you can also select. So this also includes uh, an image of the, uh, the equipment. And then once uh, all the necessary fields are entered, uh, uh, the quality equipment can be enrolled into uh, the program. And then uh, in terms of the uh, two stages, so for the uh, equipment transaction, quality and equipment transaction, we're looking at uh, if you're transferring the equipment or you're receiving the equipment, or if you are laying off the equipment, uh, that has to be uh, 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 specified. And then for the operational status, we are looking at uh, the operational status itself, and then whether the intervention has been done, and you also uh, name of the technician operating or looking after uh, the equipment, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, this, these are also screenshots. So for instance, this is for the transaction. So here you are looking at a transaction whereby the equipment is being dispatched uh, to some other facility. So this is from Boa Health Center to Kasongo District Hospital. So there are those uh, entered there. And then uh, this one, it's like now you are receiving uh, uh, the quality equipment uh, that was, uh, was dispatched. And then uh, you input there uh, the comments uh, on the right. And then this is also, these are also screenshots for the other stage. So here you're looking at uh, the operational status, uh, whether the uh, equipment uh, is working or uh, it's not working. And then you can also include some, uh, some comments there. And then uh, dashboards can be created uh, based on data that uh, has been uh, highlighted. So for instance, here you're looking at uh, the equipment uh, status. Uh, functionality status at each of the uh, each of the site, so you are able to identify which uh, uh, which facility have most of the equipment uh, equipment not working, and then intervention uh, can be done timely. And then we also have a dashboard where you are able to see uh, the equipment that are at the facility uh, were purchased by which uh, donor uh, and so and, and so on and so forth. And then uh, apart from that, you can also have a line list of all the equipment that are available at uh, a certain, a certain in the uh, entire entire country. So this is a sample of the QR code. So uh, basically there, there's information embedded, uh, looking at uh, what sort of uh, equipment, the equipment name, uh, uh, as well as the, the brand, uh, the model uh, that uniquely identifies that, uh, that equipment. So the same could you be used for some other uh, things as well, uh, like the, uh, the vaccine. So as a way forward, uh, we're looking at ensuring that uh, maybe the manufacturers, as they are manufacturing the equipment, uh, they can already uh, standardize the QR, QR code or uh, the barcodes uh, uh, so that uh, the costs that are incurred in ensuring that the QR codes are printed out uh, can, be, can be avoided. So we need to have uh, some standards of what sort of information should be encoded on the QR codes. And then apart from that, uh, based on the uh, pilot, uh, as well as the, uh, maybe rolling out to some other facilities, uh, get as much feedback uh, as possible, and then see uh, how this can also be applied to some other countries. So in that case, we would want to work with a uh, HIP center at the University of Oslo to ensure that uh, this can also be packaged, packaged into metadata that can be utilized in other countries as well. So apart from that, Malawi is also providing routine vaccine programs. So apart from using it for uh, the uh, COVID-19, we would also ensure that uh, we use it uh, for some other interventions. So uh, for instance, uh, we have uh, routine uh, vaccines uh, in responding to uh, polio virus as well as uh, polio outbreak. So we think that the EVAX code chain guard can also be uh, handy uh, in, those, uh, in those interventions. And finally, I would like to uh, thank, uh, especially UNICEF Malawi for concept conceptualizing uh, the idea. And then uh, we also had the expanded program on, of, on immunization, uh, EPI, uh, welcoming the, uh, the concept. And then we also had support from the Bureau and Melinda Gates Foundation through the Konica project by uh, its implementing partners. So we have uh, Cooper Smith, uh, as well as local international Norway, uh, that's lean. And then uh, uh, finally, uh, also acknowledge is going to expand the program on immunization, uh, as well as uh, UNICEF for the uh, technical inputs uh, toward, uh, towards the, uh, the pilot. Uh, uh, thanks.
for your attention. Asante sana. Merci beaucoup. Gracias. Over to Breno. Thank you. With the mic, I will now thank all the participants and all the presenters um, and just say that um, if you can take one message away is that we're looking to build some easily uh, accessible implementable tools, but that meet the needs of both the ones implementing the ones at the facilities, but also the managers uh, at facilities connecting uh, consumption level data with uh, central level supply. Um, and then once we establish that foundation, we can take a next step and say, now what, what do we do with that data? And I would then uh, recommend that you join the session tomorrow on uh, AI machine learning and DHS2, where Vahid Rostami from Macroiz and Elmarie Klassen from HISP South Africa will be presenting. What do you then do with this data? Once we get to the level that we have uh, accurate and, and uh, better data, what can we then do with that to improve uh, supply chain management and health service management? So. Join that session as well. There's also this same session in French tomorrow. Uh, if uh, anybody you know is interested in that uh, in French. And thank you again. <laughs>